John 4. Come on, let's stand to our feet if we could honor the word on this morning. John 4, 23 to 24. John 4, 23 to 24. And uh, we've been on this creative for worship. We talked about the purpose of worship, the priority of worship, the place of worship, the process of worship. Um, and so uh, today I want to talk to you about the privilege of worship. And so much was said in those that I want to encourage you to go back to YouTube, go watch it. If you missed it, the notes are in your uh, mobile app. I encourage you to go through them. Come on, everyone standing, if you could, if you have the ability to stand, would you stand with me? John 4, 23. Come on, let's read it together. New Living Translation. But the time is coming, indeed is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in true. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in his presence. We are so grateful to, um, I'm praying uh, that God has tremendously um, blessed you, but led you through this process of worship, um, that it is more than lifting of your hands. It is more than just you singing a song, but it is a lifestyle. Worship must be your lifestyle. Amen? And so we talked about the purpose, the priority, the place, the process, the privilege is uh, something amazing. Um, when the Lord began to share these um, uh, these titles with me, when he got to the privilege, and this morning in my time, nothing was like it uh, because... Um, I always considered just the lifting of my hands in this, the song that was slow and, and, and flowy, y'all with me? And that song that just kind of leads you in. But when he got to the privilege, there was something totally different that uh, he led me into. And I want to take you to Colossians 1 because the story that we, 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 we started off with in John 4 um, and y'all know we've been talking about this where he says he's looking. God is looking for worshipers. He's seeking them out. And, uh, and I say he's not hiding uh, the principle of how to do it. We talked about the spirit and truth element is, is your attitude and your awareness that leads you to action. And so with that, in Colossians 1, and I should have the 24th verse in your notes. If you're looking in your a mobile app, you probably uh, won't see it there, but let's kind of, uh, let's put it, yeah, thank you for that. There it is, uh, the 24th verse, and we'll get there. Because he starts off saying, I now rejoice in my sufferings, um, and for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body, which is in the church, I'm um, reading from the New King James, I apologize there, uh, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And look at verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to who? His saints. To them God will, uh, willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may be present, every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Amen? I, I, I want to um, share with you that I, 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 maybe let me just speak to my, for myself. I feel like we do not know and understand the concept of privilege. I believe we absolutely understand the concept of entitlement. May I even suggest to you, we understand entitlement more than we understand privilege. We may even worship God based off of an entitlement spirit versus in a privileged spirit. So because entitlement is feeling like you have the right to do something, but privilege is something that's granted to you from a source outside of you. And therefore, it, the same, uh, it, it also has the ability to be taken away. And so because of, uh, we have functioned so long under an entitlement mindset, we feel like we can lift our hands when we want to. 
Because we have the right to, I have the right to lift my hands when I want to, I have the right to lift my hands when I don't want to. I have the right to stand up when I feel like it, and I have the right to sit, sit down, I have the right to do whatever I want. You cannot tell me how to worship. It's an entitlement spirit. And so the entitlement spirit does, I don't have to bow my knees, I, I can stand up. No, because we have functioned so far under entitlement. I have the right to worship the way I want to, that when it comes to the privilege, we're absent-minded. We don't understand it. See, a privilege is a special advantage not enjoyed by everyone. A, a privilege, see, if you're very snooty or prideful or, or, or you, you want a, a, a Burger King experience, have it your way, you probably don't allow just anyone the privilege to even be your friend. Because you have based it off of that element, you understand privilege from that perspective. I don't want to allow. Matter of fact, uh, there are certain entitlements that you like, but it becomes privilege when it's personal. Only does privilege play a part when it's personal. Now as I have privileges that I'll give you that I'll let you speak to me. I'll give you privileges when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when, you want, when, 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 when I'll text you if I feel like it. There's a privilege when I extend stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's a privilege that comes from the Latin word meaning a law for just one person. It means a benefit enjoyed by one individual person or a group, whatever is available when it comes to access. Y'all with me? So watch this. Paul really blew my mind in this Colossians text. Watch this. He says this. Paul is not only talking about suffering for Christ's sake, but he's suffering joyfully. No, y'all, y'all missed it. He doesn't talk about just suffering. He talks about suffering. No, 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 come on. He doesn't just say, I'm suffering. He's suffering joyfully. Wait, hold. He, he was in prison, and he's telling the Colossians, and he has to encourage them because some other people were talking about, why are you following the jailbird? No, no, no. They were, uh, uh, they were talking about, you follow a jailbird? Imagine somebody from prison right now writing letters to the church telling us to worship as I am. Do as I do. Imitate me. Emulate me. You in prison. Begin to think about the mindset when you get the letter and I stand up here talking to you from the perspective of Paul while he's in prison. He's a jailbird telling us to give God glory. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, I need to put you in context of the Colossians. He's writing to the Colossians from jail, but he has to encourage them because he's in, there are people talking in their ear about how they're giving worship. So he's writing this letter. He says in verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. So he turns around and says, I'm in prison for you. And Paul says, rejoice that his sufferings for Christ would help this new Colossians church stand firm when they're suffering. He says, so I'm using my suffering as a model and I'm happy about it. Okay, let's go a little further. Let's, let's look at how Christ puts it. Matthew 5, 11 and 12 is in your, in your mobile notes. He says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Y'all looking at this? Rejoice, he says, this is Jesus talking, and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, y'all didn't get it. Okay, I, I could tell. You got to look at this. So his words, Jesus is saying, um, this is how you apply the short of being in prison, beaten, and dying for the faith. It comes down, I trust that the Holy Spirit will give us power to rejoice. 
So, but in the meantime, we should rejoice when people insult us falsely and all these other things that happen. L let, me, let me put it in, in layman terms. Perhaps you're, you're, you're teaching Sunday school, you're on the worship team, you're, um, you're going through all sorts of things, and people saying, this is what people tend to say. They say, wow, it seems like you do a lot for the church. You know, why are you so busy in church? Is that all? I mean, I'm just saying, it, you know, it's, no one else can do what you do. You know, it's a lot. I mean, I, shouldn't it be other people doing it? I mean, you alone are serving in all of these capacities. No, I mean, why you're leading? You, it seems like y'all got to sing all the time. Mm, that's a lot of singing. Uh, it, it seems like you're always ushering. Uh, it seems like, wow, you're always on the keyboard. And, oh, you always serving. And that suffering that they see, because they see it as suffering. Y'all see this? They feel like, man, you're entitled to a break today. You're entitled not to have to serve as much as you do. Why are you serving so much? And because they're operating from an entitled mindset, not a privilege to serve God, ooh, not a privilege to get before the people and lead them into the presence. Not that it's a privilege to stand on the door and lead people through. Not that it's a privilege to play on the keys, but it's an entitlement. And so because most people look at serving as an entitlement instead of a privilege, there are individuals that cannot understand why you do what you do. Why are you going to church every Sunday? Can't you go once in the blue moon? You're entitled to miss a Sunday. No, no, it's my privilege not to miss a Sunday. And because we don't understand worship, if you think of worship as an entitlement, you don't think you have to come every Sunday. Because, it, because you don't understand worship, because the worship is a lifestyle, then that's when you think, I can pray when I feel like it. I can get up at 6 o'clock when I want to. I get at 12 o'clock if I feel like it. I don't want to get on the prayer line. It's my prerogative. I do what I want to do. Yeah, it's my prerogative. Yeah. Because what? Entitlement becomes it's my right to get on, not my privilege. And because privilege worship brings you into a place where you realize, wait a minute, I'm getting the opportunity to do it versus I'll do it because I, when I feel like it. See, Paul uh, really wanted the Christians to understand in Colossians that um, serving the Lord was a, a joyful privilege and an honor. Seen, I can't tell you how many times I've seen wounded believers quit serving the Lord. I've seen people drop out of church and a few cases stop even following Christ. I've seen pastors leave the ministry because of criticism. I've seen people stop coming to church because someone said something to them. I've seen people get all huffy and puffy and switch from church to church because of the same principle. Because they've seen church membership as an entitlement instead of a privilege. He gives me the privilege to be in the body of Christ. Whenever you see it as an entitlement, you have the right not to come. You have the right not to serve. And you have the right to quit when somebody starts talking about you. But Jesus says that's the bonus of the privilege of being connected to me. Ooh, I know, I know. Let me, let me say it this way. Um, Acts 5, 41, he says, Count it a privilege that you've been considered worthy to suffer the shame for Jesus' name. In some small way, you're filling up what is lacking in Christ afflictions when you're enduring trials joyfully for Christ's sake for his church sake you exalt him well, so watch this so we've been probably viewing worship from an entitlement perspective and so when it comes to purpose process uh, privilege uh, when it comes to the, all of the elements of worship when we begin to look at it if you don't get to privilege you'll always function in entitlement I'm entitled to certain things. I'm entitled to lift my hands if I want to. 
No, there's a privilege to being able to lift my hands because there's in countries where they cannot lift their hands. There's places where they cannot stand up and give God glory. So you are so privileged that you don't even realize it. And so to sing is a privilege. There are certain places where they cannot whisper and they, they can't even whisper the name of Jesus. They cannot say his name. In Muslim countries where they want to give, in Israel themselves sometimes. So Muslim is not what it was. So you have... People here, we are so entitled that we don't understand privilege. And so I need you to know, first of all, that your sufferings and what God has set up. And Paul tells us in this that when he says, worship me in spirit and truth, and he's looking for those who will worship him that way, he's looking for those who know that there's a privilege to worship. It's a privilege to come on time to church. Nothing's inhibiting and stopping me. I, I, it's such a privilege to be here to lift my hands. Oh, I know this. Nobody wants to hear this. Let, let, me, let, me, let me pull you a little further in verse 25. And he says, of this church, I, made, I, am, I was made a minister. Did y'all see this? In verse Colossians 1, 25, look what it says. He says, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for, for your benefit so I might fully carry out the preaching of the word. Y'all see this? Okay. He says, I was given. Uh, it's okay. Whichever way you have it, I'll, I'll go there with you. So watch this. He says twice. Paul says that he was made or became a minister. That baffled me. How did this happen? How did he become a minister? Did someone give him a certificate? Did he go to several TBI classes? I was trying to figure out how did he become a minister? He said, I, I, I became a minister. I said, what's the process? This got me. Did he take an aptitude test that resulted and indicated you're a good minister? What made Paul a minister? Then I looked into Galatians and Paul says that God set him apart from his mother's womb. Gosh, that sound familiar. Before I formed you. Okay, let me go. Let me. Okay, let me stay here. He said, in my mother's womb. Can I go through Paul's experience? Because if he said in his mother's womb in Galatians, that did not look like his life. Y'all remember? Acts 9. Acts 9. You don't have to go there. Let's tell the story. You know the story. Acts 9, we read how Paul was approaching Damascus, where he planned to persecute and imprison more Christians. Y'all with me? And um, a lightning from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. Y'all with me? Y'all remember the story? And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul said, who are you, Lord? He says, who are you, Lord? Capital L, which indicated he realized that this was somebody bigger than him. The Lord answers him and says, I'm Jesus. Now, you got to understand the, the complexity and the funniness of this. Jesus has go gone. No, no, no. He ascended to heaven at this point. The Pentecost has occurred. Jesus, has, they just killed him. He says to Paul, Saul, excuse me, I'm Jesus talking to you, who you're persecuting. And he says, I want you to get up and enter the city. And, um, I'm, and, and then he, the Lord talks to Ananias and says, Ananias, go and lay hands on Saul. Ananias expresses concern and said, this man is dangerous. He's a known, watch this, he's a known terrorist for the, against the Lord. Go look at the text. He calls him basically a terrorist. And the Lord says to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. I am going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, watch this. So Paul became a minister of the gospel through his suffering. Okay, wait a minute. He, meaning 
He was not a volunteer for Jesus. He was basically, he had a different career path. Yet, in Galatians, he said, I was born for this purpose. But he was on a totally different career path, crucifying believers. Okay. So that means that I could be doing one thing and God says now that you now that you can see now you understand who I am now you now now that you hear my voice now you come in the church I'm going to now shift what your responsibility in life is for you once was just going to work for one thing. You once was just doing it your way, and you felt like you were entitled to live your life the way you wanted to. But now that you've encountered me, I'm now going to show you what you're going to have to go through, and I'm going to make you a minister of the gospel, and you don't have to preach from the pulpit. I just need you to go through stuff with joyfully. Oh, y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. I need you to go through some stuff, but go through joyfully. Meaning when you go through your trials, afflictions, situations, and marital problems and issues, you go through with a smile on your face, knowing that I'm more than able to navigate you through. That is your privilege of worship. See, what, what, what happens is when you're not a believer, when you don't understand the things of God, you feel like, wait a minute, I'm entitled to more. And your entitlement leads to your struggle. But when you understand it's a privilege that I keep going through struggle after struggle in my body, in my mind, in my job, I'm going through this stuff. God, why me? He said, why not you? I chose you. It's a part of my privilege to worship. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Hmm. If you know Christ, then you called to, to be a minister. He called you to serve him with whatever spiritual gifts, time, resources, and he, he has entrusted to you. It may not be a calling to preach God's word, as Paul's calling, but whatever your gifts, whatever your calling, whatever you learn, something, God has called you to do more than just come to church. See, what we don't realize, I said to you before, worship is more than singing a song. We have reduced it to a singing and song. But no, worship is a privilege and it's my whole life. My whole life is a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And so it becomes a privilege when I take what I'm going through and still honor God. God, I don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through, but let me tell you something. I give your name all the glory because you're still with me. You've never left me nor forsake me. You keep me through it. And that's why I throw my hands up because I recognize I'm not alone through this journey. I recognize that, God, you're not leaving me. So it's a privilege to still lift my hands because I got the activity of them. It's a privilege to sing because, God, I got the ability to sing. It's a privilege to give you glory because I still got the ability to do it through my circumstance. Others would have killed themselves. Others have killed themselves. Others have gone crazy and been in local bins because they could not get their mind around what they're going through. But for the grace of God, you keep my mind in order. But for the grace of God. And it becomes the privilege to lift my hands. It becomes a privilege to open up my mouth. It becomes a privilege to sing out because you chose me for this. When I understand that, that will shift your worship. You can't be silent in worship. You can't. you got to lift your hands. Why? Because he kept me. He's keeping me. And he has not left me. And I believe that. When I understand that, that shifts everything. Then when I come into church and it's time to sing a song, I don't need you to uh, push me to worship. I came to worship. It was my duty. It was my privilege. I'm not just entitled to it. It is my right. He gave me the advantage to understand that worship was what I called to do. Then it makes it easier because now they don't have to come on and sing. No, I came in here to sing. I know you leading me, but I came in here to do this because I'm trying to get his attention. And so, yes, I'll praise with you. I'm trying to get to worship. I'm trying to get to worship. God, come on, let's praise. I'll praise because I'm trying to get to worship because worship breaks me down where I'm no longer focusing on my phone. 
When I'm in worship, I'm now trying to, hey, I'm drawing him closer to me. So Because it's in worship that he changes everything. See, I, if, if more believers view the belief uh, of their walk more than spiritual duty than, than, rather than spiritual privilege, you missed it. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. We have reduced our experience to Christ down to a spiritual duty. It's my duty to come to church. So when I don't feel like doing my spiritual duty, I don't do it. Because spiritual duty is entitlement. Spiritual privilege is I have to do it. I've been given the advantage to do it. Okay, okay, watch this. Paul says to them um, in Romans 5, I'm almost through, watch this. He says, he, he goes in Romans 15, 18, he says, Paul refers to what Christ had accomplished through him in the power of the spirit. And then he adds, so that from Jerusalem and around from all of Instagram, I have, uh, have fully preached or fulfilled the gospel of Christ. He basically says, um, because of my spiritual privilege that God has allowed me, I'm able to do my job everywhere, even in times when I've been locked up. Some of us, problems start occurring and we shut down what he gives you the privilege to do. Because of spiritual duty, and you think I'm not fit for duty, so I can't do it. But when there's spiritual privilege, I go past what I thought I could not do. And Holy Spirit, you give me the power to still serve. Spiritual duty, I start shutting down. I need a ring, I need a ring, I can't take no more. You got me doing way too much. I got to do communion. I got to do baptism. I got to do this. I got to do all these things. It's too much. Spiritual privileges. What? You going to let me do communion? And I get to do baptism? And I get to do that? Oh, my God. Thank you for using me. What a privilege in worship. But when it's a duty, it's entitled. Uh, I don't feel like I, I, I'm doing too much. Really? Because at home I see you do multiple things all the time and you're posting multiple, multiple. I'm doing all sorts of things because you're, you're in, your privilege is I'm privileged to do everything I want at home. But no, the privilege doesn't, doesn't come to church. It's just entitled. I have the right to say no. Oh, I better stop. I, I better stop. No, I'm going to stop. I'm quit. I quit. See, watch this. Can I put it this way? I'm, I'm closing. I'm closing. Worship is not about my preference. Matter of fact, can I just say this? Worship is not about your preference. Worship is about meeting with God. However, whenever, wherever, worship is a distinct privilege. When we meet with God, we experience the power in worship to function. Okay, watch this. When you get into worship, that's when you realize the situation hasn't shifted. But when you're in worship, now you realize you shifted. Yeah. Only when you get into worship, when you're crying out and you're on your face and God says, all right, get up. It's going to be okay. And you get up under the power of worship and now your attitude has shifted. Your awareness has shifted. And now you've worshiped him. How? In spirit and in truth. Now it shifts what? My anticipation and expectation of what God's going to do. It shifts it. Watch this. Can I, can I prove it to you? I, let me prove it to you. I'm going to close with this example. Luke 17. There were some guys, some leopards. You familiar with the story? Okay, I, I, so I'm going to skip through the story a little bit because you're familiar with it. There are some leopards. There are 10 in particular leopards. These leopards in uh, Luke uh, 17, 11 through 19, uh, the, um, they, they, they all come. They're crying out to Jesus, and uh, their cries hit Jesus' ears. And um, one man in particular was very obviously showing his appreciation because he came back. And the text indicates to me without um, isogeting it that the other nine must have been of Jesus' kind. Now, actually, watch this. He says, you're a Samaritan. What about the nine? Which indicates that the other one, other nine, were Jews. The Samaritan, unlike Jesus, goes, Jesus says, I ain't even come for you. 
I came for those who are healed. They didn't come back. You came back. Look at the text. Look at the text. I, I, I got to close this out, but look at the text. He says, your faith has made you whole. Now, this is a very interesting thing. He says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well or whole. But the contents of this, when I begin to look at the word well in the King James Version, not whole, it says well. The text, I begin to dig a little deeper into it. It was the word sotar, which means savior delivered. So he means when he says, because I used to think that was a different special type of healing for this guy. But he just simply said, I have now saved you. He said, not only are you healed, you're now saved. You Samaritan. So now the Samaritan is functioning now from a privilege to worship. Because he went through something, experienced Christ, but he came back to give him worship because he understood now I'm saved. And when I'm saved, it changes everything. Now his whole situation, because let's look at this concept, your faith has made you whole. Now faith is the substance of things. So the principle of it, it, it becomes a privilege element, not an entitled element. Because his faith made him well. Watch this. His faith, the substance of things hoped for, changed his condition. So when I function by faith and not by sight, he says, I now give you the ability to function from privilege, not entitlement. So when I lift my hands, I don't feel like it. I'm lifting my hands in faith because I don't feel like it. I'm now setting in order. God, look, I understand that I have the privilege to still worship you even in my condition. Oh, okay, I got to stop. I got to stop. Oh, I'm too far over. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Skip, skip, skip. Mm. Okay, we got to stop there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. We got to stop. All right, all right. Listen, listen. y'all got it, right? Give me the hands that got it. Got it. Okay, watch this. So, 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 so. The privilege that God is extending to us, we got to be so careful because we're in a culture that... Um, has based everything we do off of entitlement. Once I go to college, I'm entitled to this. Once, no, once I do this, I'm entitled to that. Our children are being raised in an entitlement era. And so um, they think that they're entitled to cell phones. They don't know the privilege. And you, because you're stuck in an entitlement mindset, you don't know the difference either. So you think your children are entitled to cell phones even at an early age. And you don't recognize the privilege. Um, my, can I share, share the, uh, the money story with, with the rent and stuff? Can I share it? Can I share it or not? I can? All right, so... so uh, no, because I, I didn't want to share this unless she gave me permission, because just that, you know, it was a joke. It was a joke, but, you know, still, I want y'all clowning her and nothing like that. Y'all know how y'all do think y'all could speak and, you know, offer what I say to them. But anyway, um, so, so, so she, she graduated, and I was like, we were like, man, I was so excited, and I was like thinking, I was like, okay, did I do everything I could do as a father to teach her, um, the next level of living. And I'm just like thinking, and, and, and we always talked about, so she felt like the first end of her senior year, I was being very difficult because I was making her find ways to make money because she couldn't get a job because she's doing gymnastics, and I was very difficult. I said, if you don't find a way to make money, I'm going to take your car. You know what I'm saying? Because you, you, you gotta, if you're gonna make, you're either going to make some money. So I started hooking her up with jobs. So she started driving for people. She started getting excited because then kids started asking her, hey, can you take me home for $10? She said, like, yeah, that's my price. Come on. And so she was making money the way she could 
based off of her schedule. Y'all feel, feel me? And I got really proud. I said, so, so you know, they, they would remind me, oh, you, 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 you always complain about money. I'm not, I was not complaining about money. Um, what I was complaining about is you don't understand the value of what you're driving. You're driving a $5,000, $6,000 car. You don't understand the value because you didn't pay for it. So you're in, you have an entitlement spirit, not a privileged spirit. It's a privilege to drive. It's a privilege. You understand privilege. So I'm trying to teach her the difference without saying these words. You follow me? So she graduated. It was exciting. She went and had the all night thing. The next morning, she wakes up. I come into her room. I said, baby, I'm so excited for you. You got your diploma. I, I did say that. Okay, I rushed. It was, okay, she wants, if I don't give detail the way Nia gives detail, I'm not giving it right. I rushed into her room in a panic. I said, Nia, I'm so excited you graduated. She was like this. She was like, she's like, what, dad, what? I said, now that you graduated, I want you to know rent is due. I said, rent is $25. I said, your car payment, you, you have a car payment now. Car payment is $10. I said, the phone that you, you talking on is $5. I said, I want my money in July. <laughs> you, you graduated. You now must pay these items. Now, she was like, take, I said, no, I'm serious. I need this money. Your phone will get shut off if I don't get $5. Your car will get repo if I don't get $10. You will get kicked out and go to your grandma's house if you don't get $25. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like this. Dad. And every day, every day I go in, I say, Nia, where's my money? Don't play with me. You better get a job. So she's been filling out applications all over the place. I said, as long as you're filling out applications, you're getting grace. Y'all missing it. As long as I see you working from a privileged perspective, not an entitlement perspective, you got grace. The moment I see you not doing it, I'm like this. I'm about to take the phone. Matter of fact, I ain't going to take it. I just shut it off. I'm going to call him and say, shut this one down. This account must be suspended. Y'all missing this. So wait, let me, let, me, let me take that point and bring it spiritual. What we don't realize is we want all the blessings from God without doing the privilege of what he asked you to worship. <laughs> so, so we're like, oh God, bless me with more money, but you don't tithe. You're not a tither. So... <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I can't give you more because I can't trust you. You're a thief. Oh, y'all don't like me. Y'all don't like me. And so, so wait. So now he says, wait, you want a healing. You want, you want me to heal, but you're not doing anything for the healing. There's no worship. There's no lifestyle. How you want what you're not willing to understand the sacrifice and suffer through in order to get. Because you might not want to lift your hands, but my lifting of my hands creates an atmosphere for God for you to heal. Yep. Okay, I got to stop. I got to stop. No, I got to stop. So, so what I'm trying to teach my daughter is simply, you're not, you, these are not entitlements. It's a privilege to live under this roof. It's a privilege to have access like this. There are privileges. And because we are living in an entitlement generation, it's hard to worship God right. You think you can worship, come anytime you want to worship. When I get there. You don't do that on your job. Why? Because you know it's a privilege to work there. Do it a few times and that privilege will be snatched from you. <laughs> I'm closing, I'm closing. So watch this. Because you understand the paying system and you have earmarked God as a God that does not pay well. 
No, no, no. You, you, that's how we earmarked it. He don't pay well. You don't believe in his system. And so because of that, the privilege to lift your hands, the privilege to come on time to church, the privilege to pay tithes, the privilege to do what he's called you to do, you consider it as, God, I know what your Bible says, but I don't believe it, so I'll come when I feel like it, kneel when I want to, and sing when I feel like it, and all the other stuff, God, I still love you. You know my heart. I preach to myself first, always. I'm preaching to me first. When I begin to work on this and God begin to show me, he says, there are certain things that you're going through. You're going through because I need to see if you're true. When he tested Abraham with his son, it was a test of privilege. <laughs> Come on, those who know the scripture, I don't have time to go there. It was a privilege test. He wanted to know if I give you, make you father of nations, could you handle it if I take your one that I promised? It was a privilege test. And he passed the privilege test. Please pass the privilege test of worship. Could you stand with me? I want to pray for you. Father, I tried to be obedient 